a researcher for professional associations, I'm often impressed by the research team at the Specialty Coffee Association of America because, as Tracy had mentioned, they've been doing research for a really long time to better understand and gain insights into the minds of the specialty coffee drinker. And from my experience, SCAA is one of those associations that really develops and continually changes their research to keep a finger on the pulse of the coffee industry, to follow and track coffee trends, to understand and identify motivators, and really understand and capture the passion of the coffee consumer, the specialty coffee drinker in general. So what the research I'm going to talk about today really builds, as Trace was saying, on a lot of the stuff that they've already done. First, let me give you a little bit of a retrospective before I dive directly into the current research. SCAA took it to the streets in 2011 when they began looking at the specialty coffee consumer. They literally sent camera crews out to the streets of San Francisco and stopped people with coffee cups in hand, asking them, what are you drinking and why? And one of the other questions that they asked was, what does specialty coffee mean to you? Well, think about that question for a second, especially in light of what Tracy had mentioned about the word specialty. How would you answer that question? What they immediately recognized was that even specialty coffers don't recognize the word specialty. So who are these coffee consumers and then what exactly are they drinking? Well, this formed the basis of a 2012 qualitative research study that was conducted in Los Angeles and Portland. Results showed that specialty coffee drinkers crossed gender and age, education, and socioeconomic lines. They're not particularly price sensitive, but as we saw, they do have difficulty describing what makes their coffee better. So they were asked to create a collage depicting what specialty coffee meant to them. And some of the information that they found out was that these specialty coffee drinkers have a deep emotional attachment and love for their coffee. So while they may not be able to define specialty, they sure are willing to enjoy it. For example, we learned that specialty coffee drinkers are willing to pay premiums for what they consider to be product or experiences that they consider special. So looking at the 2012 qualitative information, they were able to take that specialty coffee consumer group and segment it into two specific and distinct groups, the specialty adopters and the super specialty drinkers. Now the differences between these two groups were defined based on behavioral differences how often they drink coffee, how much they're willing to pay for coffee, the types of brands and differences in the products that they purchase, and even the type of coffee shop that they most frequent. What we found out was that there's definitely a need for a greater understanding of the specialty coffee consumer. What are their characteristics? What are their habits? What are their preferences? What are their purchase behaviors? And what are the motivators behind these purchasing behaviors? So some of the questions that we asked when devising the survey instrument for this study included, where are you drinking your coffee? How often are you drinking your coffee? What time of day? What type of coffee do you prefer? And how many days a week are you drinking coffee? Although I'll tell you, <laughs> that there was one person who said they drink, 10, they drink coffee 10 days a week. Um, so personally, I think they need to cut back. <laughs> we wanted to understand better the differences between these coffee drinkers. This quantitative study is really an initial first step. And we're hoping that this will lead, potentially, to a long-term study where we can further explore the differences between specialty adopters, understand their journey, and better connect with the specialty coffee consumer. So the 2016 uh, specialty coffee drinker survey was conducted by Marketing General Incorporated in March, um, from March 15th to March 19th. 
we collected data using a consumer panel from 250 people. Now that sounds like a small sample, but with a margin of error of about 6%, we felt comfortable with this as an initial jumping off point. You can see from the map that the respondents were more heavily located along the East Coast and in the Midwest, but respondents did represent various locations across the country, including several coffee-centric areas, such as the Pacific Northwest and California. Upon completion of the data collection, we did segment the groups um, into what we called adopters and supers for short. The segmentation was based um, on as many as nine individual questions in the survey. And these were derived from what we had learned from the initial research that SCAA had done. The segments initially, I think back in 2013, I know we talked about the, uh, the adopters and the supers being defined based on behavioral differences. In 2013, they actually refined these definitions, and the operational definitions now included attitudinal measures, such as how much do you love your coffee, and how would you describe yourself with regard to coffee. So when we use these attitudinal and behavioral measures to segment out our participants for the study, we got some interesting results. It resulted in 166 supers, now that's two-thirds of the sample, and 84 adopters. We were pretty surprised at this result because we were actually expecting the exact opposite finding. So let's jump into some of these findings. Looking at attitudinal metrics as one of the defining characteristics, we can see that 89% of adopters would characterize themselves as, as coffee lovers. And only 11% would consider themselves enthusiasts or aficionados. Compare that, however, to the supers, where 35% would rate themselves as coffee lovers, but 45% would classify themselves as enthusiasts or aficionados, and another 20% would actually go higher and say that they are coffee connoisseurs. Another thing we looked at was the freshness of the coffee. Both supers and adopters believe that it's very important for their coffee to be very fresh. But supers are almost unanimously insistent upon this aspect of their coffee, which I thought was pretty interesting as a uh, coffee layperson. Another thing we found that adopters are more likely to drink coffee for the taste and the flavor experience, whereas supers, 55% of them, more than half, say that drinking coffee to them is more of a sensory experience, something that maybe many of you can relate to. Looking at behavioral markers, adopters are more likely to buy ground coffee. Supers are more likely to buy whole bean coffee. One of the things we asked about was price points when you're buying coffee out. So for both supers and adopters, the most common price point was about four to five dollars per beverage when they're buying coffee away from home. However, 24% of adopters say that they would pay as little as two to three dollars for a beverage, compared to only 5% of supers that would ever spend that little on their coffee. So where are these coffee drinkers drinking their coffee? Are they drinking at home? Are they drinking in coffee shops? Where are they? Well, positively, most of the adopters and the supers drink coffee in both places. However, when asked, you can see that the majority of them, when they're out buying coffee away from the home, they tend to visit the larger national coffee shops. However, you'll see that there's a difference here where supers are also more likely to favor local, high-end coffee shops that have a strong focus on quality. As for the type of coffee they're drinking, a lot of them are drinking um, hot coffee and espresso beverages when they're away from home. And that's the same for both supers and adopters. But adopters also tend to have a penchant for the frozen blended beverages as well. Now, over the past few decades, we know that obtaining specialty coffee has become a lot easier. With large national retailers and local coffee shops, around every corner, finding specialty coffee has become relatively easy. In fact, I'm sure most of you have an app for that. 
What's interesting is that specialty coffee drinkers expect the same level of quality at home that they also get from a coffee shop. And in fact, 87% of supers and 79% of adopters purchase bag coffee for use at home. Now that distinction isn't that big, but when we look at it, what we find is that supers actually buy smaller bags of coffee. In fact, 34% of supers buy coffee in bags of 12 ounces or less, compared to the majority of adopters who buy coffee in bags of 16 ounces. Now why is this important? Because it shows that supers actually spend more money on the coffee that they buy for home use. How do we know this? When we look at the average price that they paid for their coffee, the average amount that the supers will spend on their smaller bags is about $14 to $17 per bag. Whereas the adopters, who again are buying the larger bags, the 16 ounces, they spend about $12 to $15 per bag. One of the other things we wanted to know is what kind of coffee you prefer. Both supers and adopters typically buy a medium roast, but about 36% of supers prefer a dark roast. So which is better? Coffee made at home or coffee made from a coffee shop? Well, 47% of adopters and 58% of supers said it doesn't matter. Location doesn't matter. It's equally good in any place. However, that means that the remaining percentage of either group picked one or the other. So let's look at that for a second. Adopters are more likely to say that the coffee from a coffee shop is better. Why the disparity here? Well, one of the theories that we have is it boils down to um, knowledge, confidence, and education. When asked to rate themselves on a coffee knowledge scale, supers are consistently more likely to rate themselves as having a superior knowledge about coffee compared to adopters. In fact, they're more confident and more comfortable using terms like um, coffee origin, extraction, grind size, these terminologies, this terminology that adopters are not yet comfortable with. Additionally, supers tend to be better educated about the brew methods and the variety of methods available for specialty coffee drinks. So getting back to what makes coffee from a coffee shop better than coffee at home, the adopters are more likely to say, well, because of the type of coffee used at the coffee shop and the brew method. So this might suggest that again, that knowledge and education and confidence, the adopters aren't as comfortable or as confident in building their own coffee. Now, on the flip side, for supers who feel that the coffee at home is better, they also said it was because of the brew method, suggesting that perhaps they are very confident in building their own coffee and the methods that they use to do it and make it exactly the way they like it. And in fact, supers um, have a greater tendency to only drink the coffee that they make at home. When we are looking at the specialty coffee consumer, we are really trying to also understand the coffee journey and what that looks like. We've seen some of the differences between supers and adopters, a very high level for the research today. And what I want to tell you is that although that there are differences, the journey itself actually can be very similar. The accepted theory is that specialty coffee drinkers evolve over time. But where does that journey start? And what promotes that change while they're along that evolutionary path? So we wanted to ask, when do you start drinking coffee? And what we found out was that adopters and supers do tend to start drinking between the ages of 15 and 21. But supers are more likely to start on the earlier end of that range, between the ages of 15 and 18, whereas adopters are more likely to start drinking coffee after the age of 18. Now, momentum along that coffee continuum actually depends on a couple different factors. And one of the most important factors has to do with an interest in trying new brands and trying new coffees. And we can see that this is true for both supers and for adopters. But one of the things that was very interesting was that more than twice as many supers also showed a growing interest in learning more about coffee in general. 
Thus, they were further along on that coffee continuum. So we talk about the flavor journey. And they're looking to try new coffees, and they're looking to try new flavors. But how do they choose a new coffee? What are the words that resonate with them? For both groups, we found that descriptions that focus on flavor experiences and what they can expect from a particular brew were very intriguing for specialty coffee drinkers. Similar to what we heard about um, wines. They might be described by their fruity or earthy undertones. Specialty coffee drinkers really enjoy learning about what flavor combinations they might expect from a particular blend. They're also concerned with um, information about fair trade and sourcing practices. That information about the coffee is intriguing to them as well. So they're learning more about coffee, and they're trying new flavors, and they're reading connoisseur blogs and websites. It's no wonder that the specialty coffee drinkers, both adopters and supers, feel that their tastes and preferences have changed over the years. No longer are they as interested in the sweet and creamy where they started, but they prefer a stronger, bolder, roastier brew in general. At the beginning of the presentation, I talked about, and Tracy had mentioned, how specialty coffee drinkers don't really recognize the term specialty. So we flat out asked them, what word would you use to describe the coffee that you're drinking? And premium was the word that both groups felt was the best fit. Specialty was third, but gourmet was often picked by the supers, and sophisticated was one of the second choices often picked by the adopters. I think that the research findings overall have supported a lot of the qualitative studies that were, had come before it. And there's definitely a path that we can see for transitioning that specialty adopter into the super specialty drinker category. One of the things that we need to look at needs to be taken into consideration, and that has to do with awareness and education. One of the things I need to point out also is that while we talk about adopters and supers, the distinction between the two groups is not always clear cut. Individuals may possess characteristics or attributes that you might easily identify with an adopter, but then have purchasing patterns that we would feel are reminiscent of a super. So in moving forward with education awareness, we need to be aware of the overlap between these two categories and understand better how they fit along the continuum. Through education and awareness and greater exposure to coffee practices and new flavors, we can help facilitate the transition from the coffee adopter into the coffee, the specialty, the super specialty category. Thank you.